Okay, so it's nine o'clock in the UK where I'm um, speaking from today. So we're going to get started. My name uh, is uh, Christina Silva and I run the Cactus Networking Project with my colleague, Sarah Bullock, who's here as well today, waving at us there. Um, Welcome to the 11th in our series of webinars uh, organized by the Cactus Networking Project. We're based uh, in the Department of Sociology at the University of Surrey in Guildford, uh, not far from London. Uh, today, uh, we are going to be having a webinar with uh, Anuja Cabral from Australia, who I will introduce to you shortly. Uh, but before we get started, uh, just to let you know that we have one more webinar after today's uh, on um, oh, I've got the wrong one up. That's not the right one, but we've got another one coming up at the end of the month. I'll tell you about that at the end of the webinar. Um, so uh, do uh, join into that one as well. All of our webinars are, are on our YouTube channel, so you can access recordings. We will be recording this one as well, so you'll get the link to that uh, later on uh, this week. We've also got various uh, training courses coming up uh, that are all being run online at the moment. Uh, for obvious reasons, uh, and we are uh, really pleased to still be able to uh, provide discounts uh, to um, those training courses uh, to support researchers and students uh, whilst working at home. So do uh, uh, tap into those uh, and other resources on our website. Okay, so on to uh, today's webinar. Um, I'm delighted uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Anuja Cabral, who's an independent qualitative researcher of more than 20 years. And as I said, is based in Melbourne, Australia from where she's speaking uh, with us today. Uh, she's going to be uh, talking uh, about uh, using uh, qualitative software and uh, from the context of teaching methods and software simultaneously. Anuja has got lots of experience uh, in this field. She runs workshops on qualitative research methodology and design and also in the use of a, a variety of different uh, qualitative uh, packages, including Envivo, MaxQDA, Quercos, Delve, and Deduce. And she's going to be touching on a couple of those uh, today in her talk. Anuja's research interests and experiences are really broad. She's worked with a variety of different methodologies and across many disciplines and substantive topics, including but not limited to social welfare, migration and mobility, architecture, psychology, and teaching and learning. So it's the latter topic that Anuja will be speaking uh, about today as she discusses and reflects on teaching qualitative methods and software simultaneously, which is a topic that both myself and Sara have a keen interest in. So we're really delighted uh, to have you here today, uh, Anuja, and uh, really interested to hear uh, your reflections uh, on this topic. Uh, whilst Anuja is speaking, please, uh, everyone, do feel free to post your questions or comments in the chat function. Uh, and Sara and I will collate those and post them to Anuja uh, when she's finished her talk. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to you, Anuja. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, and I will stop my share and let you begin. Thanks, Christina. And thanks, everyone, for being here. And um I guess, taking part in this webinar. And thanks, Christina, for inviting me and thinking of me. I, um, yeah, I think this topic idea came about after lots of chats with you, really. Um, before I begin and start properly, one thing that we do in Australia before we start any sort of workshop or session is what we do is call an acknowledgement to country. And given that I'm based in Australia, and there might be others around the world, or even I think I know there's at least one other person from Australia, I'd like to do an acknowledgement to country. What an acknowledgement to country is in Australia is actually paying respect and recognition to Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging. And what we do is we, we recognise that the lands on which we meet and that we're meeting on are unceded lands of the Indigenous people. The land that I'm specifically on, the ground on which I'm meeting you today, is owned by um, traditionally the Wurundjeri people. And I would genuinely like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and actually say thank you to them for looking after the land and living in harmony with the land, 
for well over 50,000 years. Given we're in the middle of climate change, <laughs> and I think there's a lot that we can learn from different communities and people who did protect and look after the land for so long. So that's something that we do here in every meeting and every session in Australia, but I would just like to pay my respects. Um, my sessions are, whenever I talk, I'm generally quite informal. So I do love to see videos on if you're comfortable with that. And if not, that's completely fine as well. Um, the reason I'm today we're talking, or I wanted to talk about methods and software together and why I think it's important. Um, the reason why I think it's important is because I think at every stage of qualitative research or every stage of research, there's a lot of thought and reflection and planning that goes into it. So before we even begin the research, there's a lot of thought that goes into framing the research question and getting that right. And then that works in tandem with the types of data that you'll be collecting, um, how you're gonna approach data collection. Even before that, you've got the stage of thinking about all the ologies, epistemology, phenomenology, all, all the ologies that go into, well, how do I view truth? What are the, what's the lens I'm looking at the data through or the project through? It's a lot of thinking that goes on in qualitative research. Then even at the data collection stage, we think about what type of data do we want? How are we going to collect data? What type of data will we use? If you've decided on a particular method of collecting data, you will also think about the type of tech you'll be using to collect it. So for example, if you're doing interviews, you'll be thinking, how do I record those interviews? <laughs> and you'll have, um, you know, people often ask, what's the best device and what's the best app and does it do recording? And there's a lot of thinking, does it do transcription? And we see this a lot in, in the Zoom era or the online era. They'll go, right, what's the best platform to use to actually collect my data? Should I be using Zoom? Should I be using Teams? Should I be using something else? Um, and people think about that, but they think about it also in terms of, well, what are the next steps? How do I, um, oh, well, actually Zoom can now audio, can record stuff and print out a transcript. So can Teams, but there's a lot more even in the nuances of how easy something it is to use. When we think about the methods of data collection, how easy it is for us to gather. So if I know one project asked for people and families to take photographs of how they met and when they were together and how they used technology. So the researcher thought about what kind of a kit she'd have to put together to communicate that to the families. So there's a lot of planning that we do in qualitative research. Some of, we might not realise how much planning goes into it because so much of it is seen as incidental, but so much, so much of it is chatted about. We actually chat to people about this. Um, I'm quite active on, on Twitter and I swear every other day there's something about, so what platform do you use to kind of do your interviews or how, what, what software do you use to transcribe or, you know, all of that kind of stuff. There's a lot of thinking that goes on in, in it. But when it comes to analysis and when it comes to methods of analysing data, for some reason, I feel like there's crickets and I feel like there's not a lot of thinking that goes into software and analysis. Okay, um, so I wanna share a little story with you about the first time that I learned properly qualitative research software. But before I do, I just wanna get a little, if you could all give me some sort of a reaction, I'm gonna ask you a few questions. I wanna know firstly how, um, Give me a reaction for those of you that are really comfortable, really confident with using qualitative research software. You know, you'd think, yep, I can do that. That's really simple for me. So just give me some sort of a reaction on your, on your screen. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> I've got a maybe, I've got a few. Okay, all right. So there's a few different ones here. How many of you think that, um, how many of you are kind of, I can use software for analysis, but I think I could use it better. I don't think I'm using it to the, the way the software is kind of meant to be used. 
yeah, like there's so much more I could know about the software for analysis. How many of you kind of think that? Yeah, three, four, five, six, yeah, seven, eight. Yeah, probably, yeah. And that's, that's probably one of the, th <laughs> I'm getting a lot of yeses. <laughs> a few confidence and a lot of yeses. My very controversial question is how many, and, and please be completely honest in this, okay. How many of you think that we, how many of you think that software isn't, oh, gosh, I had the question framed really well in my mind and now it's just flown, the framing of it's just flown. I guess to put it in a really kind of non very right, correct way, as in the language isn't quite right. How many of you think that qualitative, that software should not be used for qualitative analysis? None. How many of you have heard people say that qualita that, qualita that software is not good for qualitative analysis or should not be used for qualitative analysis? How many of you have heard that? You've heard that. Okay. So I'd say about a third of you have kind of heard that. So it's a really common conception as well. Okay. So... <laughs> There's a real mix. I want you to, we'll come back to this, okay? Um, the most common thing that I see, and I'm sure Christina sees, and I know there's other trainers in the room, that you probably see is people going, yeah, I kind of know how to use the software, but I'm not using it to the best of my ability for analysis. So I told you I'd tell you a little story about the first time I did a proper qualitative research software course. And it was when I learnt in vivo, and it was in 2007. And I remember it very, very well. I, you know, caught a bus into the city and um, my supervisor at the time I was doing my PhD said, no, Anuja, I, I know you know it, I know you learn it, but you, you really need to, um, I think it's really important for you to do a course. To give you a little bit of context in this, I, for 16 years, worked with um, someone who, who was the PhD student of Lynn Richards, who developed Envivo, the qualitative research software. Um, I used to talk to Lynn regularly while I was doing my PhD, um, but I, I still didn't, like you, all of you, I still felt I just don't know. I, I don't think I'm using it very well. So I went and I did this course and it was a two day, full two day course, kind of nine till five. And halfway through the second day, I left. I, I, after lunch, I walked out and I just did not come back. The reason is because when I was being taught the software and the trainer was amazing, she knew Envivo so well. She taught me Envivo, like I, I had sessions with her. She's an amazing woman and an amazing trainer. But the reason is when I was learning Envivo, I learned how to click. I learned how to code. I learned how to do an annotation. I learned how to import documents into Envivo, but I just didn't know how it related to my research. So I'm in the session and, you know, I'm like, right, importing Word documents, great. I'm importing survey data, fantastic. Um, and I'm creating nodes or in the latest version of Envivo, they're called codes. And I'm learning that you can have a little hierarchical structure and you can code and you can code to more than one node at the same time. And I'm learning this terminology. Um, great. Then I learned that you can ask lots of questions using Envivo. You can do a coding query and a matrix query. I learned that you can do things like annotations and um, for those of you that don't know Envivo, uh, your brains might be getting a bit full. And even if you do know Envivo, you might be getting a bit confused with what I'm saying. Um, this is kind of how I felt in the session. I'm like, great, I know how to code. I can run some queries. I can add comments to Word documents. That's fantastic. And it was two full days or one and a half days of just learning stuff. But when I walked away, I didn't remember a lot of it. Like I remembered how to do something, but I didn't remember how it all connected. And so this is a little bit embarrassing to admit, um, but when I walked away, 
and I started using in vivo for my PhD, I really wanted to use some of those tools. I Like in Microsoft Word, you can add comments. I really wanted to add a comment in the documents that were in in vivo, and I knew you could do that through something called an annotation. And I remember that she had said, you can also create a see also link. So if someone talks about a topic, you can link it to someone else that's talked about a topic. Great, I kind of want to do that. And I added annotations. So I added comments and lots of written words and I added links, but I missed bits. I didn't realize that I couldn't then search, didn't realize how I could search the text of my annotations. So I had all these notes, this kind of research journaling that I'd done analysis that I'd done that was sitting in really disjointed places that I didn't know how to find. But also I didn't know why I was creating how I was using my annotations in any kind of meaningful way. Um, I don't know, is any of this sounding familiar to anyone? <laughs> Can you show me if this is sounding familiar to you? Yeah, a, th a hands up if this is kind of sounding, you kind of feel a little bit lost when you're using it. Okay. So <laughs> I can see someone laughing and that's good because I kind of really, I, yeah. Um, so I was taught how to use the software. I was taught how to analyze data. I, it, was, it was kind of thematic coding that I was doing and I could do it on paper, no problem. I could print out something and I could highlight and I could add notes. But I, I, even back then, it, it, there was kind of this expectation there's this kind of idea that you will use software for qualitative analysis. It's kind of a trend. It's often what's expected. I'm also seeing a lot of projects that have 20 interviews or more or have multi-methods. So there's lots of different types of data people are collecting. It takes time and effort to analyze that by hand. But I also just think if we're really honest, people are using software to analyze qualitative data. People want to use software to analyze qualitative data. They just don't know how. So I lost stuff. I lost some deep thinking. It cost me a lot of time. Creating things in NVivo and not being able to find it and not being planned or systematic about it, not understanding how I could use it, lost me a lot of time. So we're, uh, we're at this place. So that's my in vivo story. And it, yes, it's embarrassing. <laughs> but we're, at, we're kind of at this place where people are taught methods and methodology. And within the methodology courses, research methods courses, one is if you're taught qualitative research well, I think that's fantastic. If you're actually taught just qualitative research on its own, I actually think that's also unique. There's a lot of qualitative research courses I know that don't talk analysis. It's kind of missing from the curriculum. So even on top of that, when you kind of narrow it down even further, you've got research methods courses, and then you've got qualitative research methods courses, which is a bit more unique. Um, and then underneath that, if they've got qualitative analysis in there, fantastic. But very, very few of them don't have software. And I question why, if it's really common now and understood that people will be using software for qualitative analysis, why is that part missing? I have some theories, I have some ideas on why that is, and I'll talk to you about that as well. One is because I think there's still people that say it doesn't help with qualitative analysis. It makes qualitative analysis worse. There's this kind of idea with some people, and that's why I asked you at the start, and about a third of you put up your hand. You've heard that people say, don't use qualitative research software for analysis. So one is that that idea is still prevalent. The other reason, and in my opinion, this is the main reason, and I think more than half of you put up your hands for this one, is that people just don't understand how to use qualitative research software well. Is that even those teaching qualitative 
courses haven't been trained well in how to use qualitative research for analysis. Okay, so we've got people that teach analysis and we've got on the other side <laughs> a whole bunch of YouTube videos on how to do software. But I haven't seen any YouTube videos that teach you how to use software for analysis yet. They might be out there, I haven't seen them yet. And I, I personally haven't seen qualitative research courses that teach analysis with software well. So there might be some that teach it that say, you can code using, using NVivo, for example. You can code your data using NVivo, create codes and put information in them, put your, to code your data into it. For me, that's not teaching you how to analyze data using software. That's teaching you how to categorize your data using software. And I hope that enough of you in the room know that categorizing your data is not analysis. It's just categorizing it. It's putting it into themes or categories. It's not thinking, it's not, it's not full on analysis. So that's why I think this conversation is really important to have. And I want to, I'm keeping a track on the time because I can ramble. Um, one of the things, um, what I want to do with you today, because sometimes demonstration is the easiest way to explain something, I want to demonstrate two different types of cactus, so two different types of qualitative research software. And I want to show you the difference between showing you the software and showing you and talking to you about how you can analyse it for, analyse it, use it for analysis. Um, I am not, I haven't chosen to do um, coding. I've chosen something a little bit different um, because I think different can also be a bit fun. Um, if it's all right at this point, Christina, can I just see if anyone's got any questions before I actually do the demonstration? Does anyone have any questions or comments or anything before I, I kind of go on and do a demo? No. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, let's go. Now, the first, I'm going to show you um, Quercos. And if you haven't come across Quercos, I love it. It's one of my favourite types of software. Um, and the other one I'm going to show you is NVivo. Most of you will know. I think most of you will know or at least have heard of NVivo. And what I'm going to demonstrate with today is I'm going to demonstrate showing you intercoder reliability. So coding comparisons, it's a contentious topic. <laughs> Probably as contentious as whether we use software for analysis or not. But I want to show you an example. And I'm going to start with um, Quercos. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. And I've got Quercos here. OK, let's just go to the home page. And OK, and I'm just going to take a little pause here and have a drink of water. Okay, so can you all see Quercos? Can you all see my screen? Brilliant. It's very different to NVivo. I'm sure you can all kind of see that. Um, okay, so I'll explain just very little about Quercos because otherwise we won't have time at the end for questions or comments or anything. But here, oh, I'm drawing on the screen. I didn't mean to do that. Oh, uh, hang on. Okay, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Um, oh, for some reason, I seem to be drawing. Okay, I don't know how to erase that, but anyway. Christina, do you know how to erase that? I think you've probably got the whiteboard function of Zoom activated. Oh, by do mistake. I? Um, oh, I'm doing, oh, there we go. Let's do that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so these over here, on the left-hand side are called quirks. In NVivo, you will hear them, you will um, probably know them as codes. Okay, so codes or nodes. And on the right-hand side, we've got words. We've got uh, different interviews and um, we've got quirks and you can code into the quirks. That's, I'll just pretend that that's toast. 
What I want to show you today is how you can do a coding comparison query or what some people call intercoder reliability. Okay. Um, I'm going to do my very best not to talk about how to analyze first, because it's just a habit of mine to do that. Christina, I'm hoping that you can interrupt me if I'm starting to get into analysis mode, <laughs> but I'm going to do my best. I'm going to really focus. How do you do an intercoder reliability check using Quirkos? You click on the query function at the top of your screen. Now, here in the main query section, where it's got the PR, I click there and I select highlight author. And then I click on the compare tab that's now appeared and I've got highlight author. Now the first highlight author I want is Daniel and the second highlight author I want is Anuja. That's me, so yes. Now, just to make sure that it's all updated, I'm going to click on update. Okay, so what have I done? I have clicked from the home screen on something that had query and highlight author and select one author and highlight author and select the other author and update. And here I can see the different, um, the differences. These are my quirks here on the left and on the right here. These are the quirks based on Daniel. These are the quirk coding based on me. If I click on serial, I can see the three that Daniel has coded to serial. And if I click on serial here, wow, I can see what I've coded to serial. Okay. And that's just a really simple example of probably what you get in most training. Okay you get the where to click and the how to do something. Okay. And um, you, sorry to interrupt, your screen share stopped. Did you move Oh, okay, to, oh, thank you. Probably because you closed the software, uh, I don't know what No, happened. no, 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 that's fine. Okay, so we've got, so, and that's probably a really simple example of how you see most training. Um, when you approach software, that's, that's basically what would happen. You'd know, you'd be told where to click and how to click. And then once you all had a turn at doing that and you wrote down your notes or you knew where in your booklet you were doing that, <laughs> um, where that was in your booklet, you'd mark intercoder reliability check here. Okay. Now what happens, often in training that's where that ends. But what I want to talk, what I want to do next, and this is where the methods part comes into it, is when you're talking methods and you're not talking software, you talk about why you would do intercoder reliability checks. I'm just going to stop sharing for a sec. Okay. In a methods course, if they were talking about intercoder reliability, they would talk to you about why and when you would do an intercoder reliability check. If you incorporate methods and software, if you've just seen how to do an intercoder reliability check, what if I now said to you, so that's how you do an intercoder reliability check. Now, how would you use it? Okay. So think, just pause for a moment and think, what have you just learned? Okay. And, and think about how connected you feel to that knowledge. I know that sounds airy fairy, but being qualitative research, you'll, you'll understand what that means. How connected do you feel to what I've just shown you? Okay, now if I share my screen again. Okay, yeah, not very, exactly. What if I said to you, okay, so if you're interested in doing an intercoder reliability check, you're working in a team. Working in a team requires a lot of communication and you really need to have an understanding of the type of quirks or nodes or themes that you're creating and a lot of dialogue around that and how you're coding, how you're analyzing that data. So one way that I would use an intercoder reliability check is to launch a conversation. So having shown you how to do an intercoder reliability check, 
Suppose Daniel and I are meeting or there's project leaders meeting. You can do an intercoder reliability check here and go, right, let's see what we've got coded to serial. Wow, Anuja, you've coded a lot more to serial than I have. Let's take a look at it. Why is that? Okay, hang on a minute. This doesn't even relate to serial. <laughs> Maybe we need to uncode that from serial. Yeah, that kind of does, but but hang on. You've spoken just about cornflakes. Anuja, do you have any of that stuff coded? So, and what about dislike? You've coded stuff to dislike, time, yogurt. Let's have a look at children. Okay, so we've spoken about children. Oh, if children love apples and bananas. Oh yeah, you've got a bit of that. I've just coded a bit more of that to children. And look at this one. Actually, you've coded that whole paragraph about what children like and what they don't like. And I kind of don't have that there. Let's have a chat about that. Why have you coded so much there? Now, how are we going to code? Let's have a think. Are we going to code the entire paragraph or are we going to code just sections? Okay. So one of the ways that I use intercoder reliability is to launch a conversation. Okay. Have a think about some of the different ways that you might use this for your own inter, um, intercoder reliability checks, okay? And did you know that actually, not only can you compare author and author in Quercos, you can comp compare highlight dates. And what a highlight date, date means in Quercos is compare the dates that you've analyzed against the dates. So if you're doing a really long project, you might want to compare the highlight date being really early compared to really late. I haven't got dates in this one. So you can actually compare your coding at the start of a project compared to six months down the track of a project. So not only can you do kind of a check author against author, but you can check dates against dates and see how your thinking has changed over time. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. Anuja, there's a question in the chat, I don't know if you've seen, which relates to something you've just been showing. So I thought I'd uh, just yeah. put you there, see if you'd like to answer yeah. it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if Anuja coded so many serial, why is the count of Anuja and Daniel matching at three? Or is it not a count? Um, it is a count, actually. I didn't notice that. Serial three and serial three. Ah, okay, so the count isn't actually the quantity that I've got coded. The count is, um, sorry, the count is the number of times I've got coded. So if I take a huge chunk, I could take three paragraphs and put them in serial and that was count as one. I could take one sentence and code it to serial and that would still count as one. So that's the difference between them. Yeah, that's two counts that are separated. Yeah. So yeah, hopefully that answers it. Do you see a difference between what I showed you at the start and adding that extra bit on later? How connected do you feel or how much can you relate to what I was talking about later? How many of you actually went back and thought about your own research? Thought about ways you might use it to apply for your research? Thought about whether you would use it for your research? Yeah, a show of hands. How many of you felt the difference? Yeah. And that's the difference methodology makes, talking methods and software. If we teach methods separately at the start, and then we teach software separately, what we have to do is we have to somehow in our brains, while we're trying to, <laughs> this is what happens in our brains if we teach everything separately. We've learnt the methodology or the methods. We've got our data collected. Okay, so we're, we're in the middle of trying to process, understand and do some deep thinking about our data. And then we've learnt the technology and 
what we have to do if we're taught it all separately, which is basically what happens at the moment unless you do some amazing training with the likes of Christina um, or other people who know software really well, is that you have to marry at some point the methodology and the methods of analysis, the types of analysis you're going to be doing. So often people use more than one type of analysis. The deep thinking that you've got going on with your project, as well as what is seemingly a mundane task of remembering what to click and how to click it. And I don't know how many of our brains can process all that information simultaneously. Okay, that's all at the same time. So it's no wonder that I, I see people in training, coming to training, kind of going, I'm just, I've, I've done my coding, now what? <laughs> Christina hopefully will laugh with me along with this one. And maybe some of you in, in the room will know this, but you've done your coding, now what? I've done, and they think that's analysis, now what? And really what that question is, how do I kind of marry what I'm meant to be doing with, with what else is going on? Okay. So that's the reason I think it becomes, personally, I think it becomes really important. I've just got a question. I'm just going to read it. Is teaching how to code more difficult than coding comparison? Um, no, teaching how to code is not more difficult. Um, the reason I didn't do that today is because understanding the nature of, uh, I guess, when I teach how to code and we bring in the methodology and the methods part of it is that a lot of you will start thinking about, oh, how would I analyze that and how would I structure things like that? And I didn't want that in the session today. I didn't want all of you to start thinking about how you're going to analyze your data. I wanted you to stay thinking about um, what it means to use to, soft, to, to demonstrate software and methodology together. So I think that's why, um, which I, that was just the choice I chose. I also thought it was something different that you might not have seen. But I've got one other thing I want to demonstrate, and this will also hopefully highlight why the software and methodology becomes really important. Okay. <laughs> uh, codes and themes, you can just pretend like they're the same thing. So don't, don't worry about that part. Okay. I want to show you in vivo and show you an intercoder reliability thing within vivo. Okay, please remember the purpose of this session is not to know the software um, and is not to understand how to use the software, but really it's about demonstrating what happens when we add that little bit extra and we match the software and the technology and we match methods and technology together with when it comes to qual analysis. Okay, so now I'm going to share my screen with NVivo. Okay. Now, I would love to show you how to do a coding comparison in NVivo, but it's just going to take longer than the five minutes that I believe I have. So I'm just going to do one. I'm just, there's a preset coding comparison here in, um, in a sample project in NVivo. This is the latest version of NVivo. And here we have a coding comparison. Okay. What they've done, they have selected nodes or codes or themes, <laughs> depending on the language you're using, that they want to compare. They want to basically see, um, they want to compare across these, how many nodes are there? Five. They want to compare these five codes. They've selected one interview to code. So both people will be coding that one interview and they've run a comparison across this. So they're looking at intercoder reliability. Now, as you can see, this looks very different to the Quercos software. So if we're talking only intercoder reliability, and I said, Quercos, this is how you do inter intercoder reliability. And Vivo, this is how you do intercoder reliability. There's a lot of stuff that's missing. They look very different. The way you use them and the way you find the information and the data from within them is also very different. So again, I would say you could use it for a conversation, but what if you're doing something more positivistic? If you're doing positivistic research in qualitatively, which is possible, 
Here, you've got some percentages and some numbers. So they've got the percentage that they're in agreement in terms of their coding, the percentage that they're in disagreement, and it's got not A and B, not A, not B, and, and um, A and not B, and B and not A. Okay, so I'm telling you, this tells you that for this particular document, Thomas, 89% of it has been coded in this node in exactly the same way. So they're in agreement 89% of the time. For this particular code or node, they're in agreement 95% of the time. There's basically 95% correlation or relationship in terms of their coding. 98% um, here, and you can see all the numbers. This tells me that 79% of it is because A and B did not, 79% not, of the document has not been coded by A or B, 9% of the document has been coded by both, and 10% of it has been coded by person B, but not A. Okay. Um, then you all might be getting a little bit confused now. Yeah, brain starting to hurt or going, I'm completely lost. Okay. What if I added, what if I said something? What if I said, okay, so you want to do an intercoder reliability check using NVivo. Okay. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm glad it's straightforward. That's fantastic. Um, what if I said, if you're wanting to do an intercoder reliability check using NVivo, one of the th things it does is give you percentages in which people agree in terms of their coding and in, in terms of which their coding overlaps in, in terms of where it's different. What you can do is if we double click on any of these nodes, again, we can see the nodes down the side and we can see where they're in agreement and where they're in disagreement. So here I can see they're in disagreement. If I click on that green stripe, because that person's coded that, but the rest of them have coded the whole paragraph or those two paragraphs. So again, doing an intercoder reliability check might be used as a sounding board to have those conversations about, well, okay, so some of us are just coding a sentence, some of us are coding more context. What is it that we're really wanting to do? The way your output is and the way the journals that you'll be publishing in, that will all influence what you want to do. Sometimes journals, sometimes publications, sometimes research projects require that you have 90% intercoder reliability, 95% intercoder reliability. Some don't. So sometimes those are conversations that need to happen. Otherwise, it can be used as a sounding board to kind of go, oh, well, that's really interesting. And an example of when I used an intercoder reliability check for one of my research projects, I come from a social inclusion background, um, looking at a lot of social interaction. My colleague came from a background of peer learning. We did an intercoder reliability check at the time, and we found that wherever I'd coded something to social interaction, she'd coded the same stuff to peer learning. Now, rather than going, oh my gosh, we've, one of us has coded to the wrong place, we used it to launch a conversation and to look at those bits of data. So what we did was look at those differences and actually read those bits of text. And what happened is we realized that informal social interaction, those informal moments of interaction led to peer learning. Okay, so, Different software gives you different types of visuals and different types of data. So it presents it in a different way and different information. But the way you use it and the way you apply it is what actually becomes really important. And what you do with that is what becomes important. Okay. Um, that's it in terms of my demonstrating. And I just, I'm, I'm just conscious of the time that we've got 15 minutes left. So I just want to do a little summary or rep repetition. Um, but I guess the reason I think, you know, talking about teaching and the way we teach methods and the way we teach software, and the reason I think they come together is because more and more 
many, many qualitative researchers are doing analysis using software at some point in the analysis process. I don't have data on it. I was actually trying to find statistics to see if anyone's done a project to see how many qualitative researchers are using qual software, but I just don't know. But more researchers are. And currently, if we separate, keep them really separate, we don't A, maximise the software to its full potential. It can lead to mistakes and I don't like the word mistakes, but it can lead to a more stressful and a longer process of analysis because we haven't learned how to use it efficiently and effectively. But also if we incorporate methods training with software into research methods courses, we tie in the whole research process really well. There are questions that you can answer using software that you can't answer manually. There are ways that you can examine data using software that you cannot do manually. Being aware of that, being aware of how to interpret that, being aware of what you can actually do with it, apply it and see the depth of that data using the software can influence your whole research design. It can change the framework of your research questions. So there's a big gap and a big hole if we don't actually learn to teach methods with software, but also if we don't learn to teach software without the methods part. And I would urge all of you when you are watching methods courses, um, software courses, or even if you're in a software course, to think about that and to ask those questions in the course. Ask the question, how would I apply this for my research? Yeah, because that is actually the missing link. You can use a manual, a software manual to know the how to clicks and where to clicks. You can Google search, how do I do a coding query in NVivo? What you can't search is um, actually the application of it. You can't search in what context would I use a coding query? What kind of questions can I answer using a coding query? So if you've got questions about your research or about your data, you can't question how you would find the answers you're wanting to find using the software. Um, so hopefully, I mean, that's it for me today. But thank you all for listening. And um, I'd love questions or comments. Um, but thank you. <laughs> and thanks, Christina, so much for inviting me. I had a lot of fun. Thank um, you. Anita. We had a lot of fun too. I really, really <laughs> enjoyed that. Uh, really thought provoking. I think really thought provoking both from the context of kind of those who are facilitating training and getting us to think about the way that we present um, our material, whether we're in the in the business of teaching methods or whether we're in the business of teaching software, but also really thought provoking from the point of view of um, learners as well, right? Uh, and not being passive learners, uh, kind of asking those learning environments, those learning opportunities to sort of allow these things to be married up uh, and help us um, be more efficient learners, as it were, by connecting these things. So thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed it. I think unlike um, other uh, sessions that we've done so far, given Anuja's beautiful um, kind of uh, delivery, the way that she was speaking to us um, in such a kind of uh, participatory way, I'll in invite anyone who has a question who would like to vocalize it at this point um, to do that. And otherwise, Christina and I also have a couple of questions. So don't feel um, worried if that you don't have one. But does anybody have a question for Anuja who would like to, to pose it now? Yep, Jane. I don't, thank you, Anuja, that's really interesting. I don't have a question so much, I have an observation. Um, because I'm a researcher in some parts of my work life and I'm a trainer in another. Um, and I find my, a lot of my difficulties difficulties that's not the word um, I find actually quite a lot of reticence about using software and it stems from supervisors 
and supervisors who have and actively discourage people from using the software, partly because they've never used it themselves. And that's the biggest barrier. I also find that when I'm trying, that a lot of people who would like me to give them training are not prepared to invest the time to give the additional extra. They don't realize that additional extra is the necessity because actually there's a lot of foreground isn't there to do before you can actually deliver some of your messages. So it's very interesting. If I had my training, if I, I ran a course with a university and could control, that'd be different. But if when you come in cold as a trainer, it's actually quite difficult because you can't cover as much and people are object because it stimulates questions, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It's what makes the thing really sparkle. Um, <clears throat> Just so my observation. Yeah. Jane, Amazing. thank you so much. I um, One of the things I often, at the start of pretty much any of my sessions, and I, I see a couple of names that have been in them before, the thing I say at the start of every session is, if you're getting overwhelmed, the one thing to take away from my sessions is um, not the how to click or where to click, it's the how to apply it for your research. I said the other stuff you can find anywhere, but I hear you, it, it's... It, People don't understand that. And I, I so feel you about the supervisors. I see really prominent um, people who write books on research analysis talking about how they don't recommend qualitative research software. And I've mentioned to Christina once or twice, I really just want to run a free session, invite all those people in there and show them <laughs> because I think that's missing. Anyway, yes, but thank you so much, Jane. Thanks. Thank you for that, Jane. Um, we have uh, some um, questions in the chat. There's excitement about trying to follow this up, perhaps with a um, session on matching methodology and analysis hands-on. So delivering, every, getting excited about doing this now, not just talking about it. So that's great. Um, Christina and, runs amazing workshops. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also uh, a question, what about projects where you're the only researcher and if you don't have a fellow analyst to compare notes to? I wonder whether that question comes from a space of Anuja kind of opening up the idea that this is quite a that dialogue uh, is important um, in in our connection of, of methods and, and, and software um, and reflections are important. So perhaps that question comes from a place of where if you don't have a, a, a space for that sort of dialogue, um, uh, any thoughts about that, Anuja? Um, so if you don't have someone to compare notes with about, are you talking, sorry, I just wanted to clarify, is it about the intercoder reliability that you're talking? If you don't have anyone to compare um, projects where you're the only researcher? <sighs> There's a few, I mean, you can compare notes based on your past coding, but join some groups. There's a lot of free qual methods groups and methods chats that I'm seeing around at the moment, and they're open to the public. Actually, the latest one I saw is, um, uh, I don't know if you're on Twitter, but PhD Forum is actually running an open qual methods chat. Um, but there's another one up in the UK, and I don't know, if Christina, if you know about it. But there's a lot of forums. And if your university doesn't have one, start one. Yeah. Um, I would say to you, you don't need to be an expert in qualitative research to have a qual research chat or start a qual research journal club. You know, pick a topic and say, right, let's meet once a month. Whoever's interested, open to everyone, come and join. Um, talk to your research departments and um, even the main university research departments so there's more people and, and just start something and see how you go. That would be my yeah. main recommendation. Yeah, communities so, yeah. exist all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. And you probably won't be the only one keen to, to get involved in one. Yeah. Um, I'm going to answer your question in a minute, uh, Vika. Thank you for that. But if I'll just um, pose another question to Anuja from um, Christina and myself. So there's a couple uh, of ones. I'm going to be cheeky and, um, and frontline one that I was really interested in, um, which is, I really liked the way that you spoke about or asked us in the session about how connected we felt to the learning point that you had brought across, right? And so I was really interested in, in that concept of, of, of our connection to what we're learning. Um, and I was wondering whether you have anything to share about how we gauge that in an actual learning environment, how connected people are feeling to, to, the, 
to the to the material that that we're talking about as a trainer as as a yeah. teacher yeah um it's look it's really hard i think especially in the online environment um it's one of the reasons i like cameras on um you know i think it's those little body language the the nods of the head or um I don't know that it's, I think, being able to read body language, but it's also really asking questions. And I, you can all tell from my approach, am very animated and very casual in my approach. And um, I was telling Christina yesterday, this is me. Um, You don't get anyone but me. And I think if as a teacher we present ourselves and we present our own mistakes It allows people to open up and ask questions. Mm. Um, For me, the biggest way to understand if people are connecting is when they ask questions. Um, To the point, even in my sessions, especially now that we're on Zoom, I say to them, if you've tuned out and you've just tuned back in and you have a question, still ask, even if you think I've covered it. Um, Because more often than not, it's something that I haven't answered, but it shows it's really hard to stay focused for a long period of time. But if you can tell people, give them a way into re-engage or to engage, it. I think it. you can gauge how connected people are with the session. Um, and I think just being this, fumbling sometimes and doing all of that also allows people to connect, yeah. you know. So I, I think, but questions, questions is what really helps me gauge. Mm-hmm. Um, when people ask questions or comments or um, things like that, that's really what yeah. what tells me. Yeah. Thank you. And again, that's kind of um, that reflection is relevant and valuable, not just to those of us who spend time facilitating learning, but also to those of us who are learners, because yes. our ability to connect to the learning also depends on how others in the room are connecting to the learning right so if you feel everyone else has got this I'm the only one who hasn't really understood it then the likelihood of you being able to kind of ask for a bit more input is slower I I think than if others in the room are also saying can you help me connect it can you help me feel more connected and then that um, kind of provides uh, sort of license um, to Mm -hmm. ask for more. Um, Also Sorry, yeah, can I just ahead. add to that, Sarah? Yeah. I just also, as, if one person opens up and asks what that really mundane question mm-hmm. or asks for repetition, I find the whole rest of the session is like that. Yeah. You know, if you allow a participant to ask that one que- that, that question that everyone else thinks is just silly, then I find everyone else starts opening up and chatting. It just opens it up. So, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so it's uh, 58 minutes. Um, I wish we had another half an hour. I think we could continue talking about this for a long time to come. There's a couple of questions in the chat I just wanted to touch on as a as a member of the Cactus Networking Project, and it's to do with um, which software packages um, we would um, recommend. Um, we provide some resources on, on our website about um, making choices around software use um, and which package uh, might work for you. And so in our emailing out the recording of today, we'll point you to um, those resources. Um, I think Christina's also um, just put up on the slide there our website. Um, so you can go and have a look at the software reviews there. The aim of the reviews is, is, is to enable you to make choices about what's going to work for you. Um, so I would point you to those. Um, And there's also some um, questions about sharing email addresses. So I'll let you share yours um, in the chat now if you would like to do that. Um, We will um, not do that um, for for, um, sort of, you know, the the privacy reasons. Um, I want to take a moment to thank Anuja um, for a really stimulating session. Thank you so much. Um, It's given me lots and lots to think about, both both as a learner and as as a facilitator. And on behalf of Christina and myself, thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing your um, your thoughts and your experiences with you. They're with us. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks, bye, everyone. Thanks, Christina. Thanks. Thanks, Anuja.
Thanks, Christina.